Hi, I'm Mike Gilliam. Science and You starts now. I'm Carol Ann Riddell. Climate change, experts say it is here. Temperatures are rising, weather is more extreme. Today, a closer look at exactly what that means and what you can do about it, ahead on Science & You. I'm Lisa Beth Kovitz. Climate change and rising sea levels, it's changing our shorelines and our lives. Ahead on Science & You. I'm Donna Hanover. When most people look out over New York Harbor and see Liberty Island, they think freedom, immigration, history. Many scientists think oysters. We'll tell you why ahead on Science and You. I'm Mike Gilliam. For decades, solar power has meant the use of those huge, unsightly solar panels. But that's changing thanks to some innovators and artists. They're enhancing solar power. We'll show you what we mean coming up on Science and You. I'm Magali Laguerre Wilkinson. We see it and hear it every day, but we should never take it for granted. The not so simple science of weather forecasting, coming up ahead on Science and You. I'm Andrew Falzone. Every time you make a food choice, you're not only impacting yourself, but the world around you. We're here at the American Museum of Natural History, where there's an exhibit that shows how food and the environment are connected. That story's coming up on Science and You. I'm Carol Ann Riddell. We hear about it everywhere these days, global warming and our changing climate. But what does that really mean and what can you do about it? Take a look. Rising temperatures, extreme weather, melting glaciers. Many experts say it all adds up to climate change. In basic terms, the Earth is getting warmer. NASA scientists say 2012 was the ninth warmest of any year since 1880, continuing a long-term trend of rising global temperatures, as you can see demonstrated here. Just how serious is the issue? Serious enough that global leaders came together in 2009 for a climate summit. For the first time in history, all of the, major, uh, the world's major economies have come together to accept their responsibility to take action to confront the threat of climate change. After extremely difficult and complex negotiations, this important breakthrough lays the foundation for international action in the years to come. Now, this progress did not come easily, and we know that progress uh, on this uh, particular aspect of uh, climate change negotiations is not enough. Going forward, we're going to have to build on the momentum that we established in Copenhagen to ensure that international action to significantly reduce emissions is sustained and sufficient over time. At home, that means continuing our efforts to build a clean energy economy that has the potential to create millions of new jobs and new industries. And it means passing legislation that will create the incentives necessary to spark this clean energy revolution. But getting back to the basics, to understand climate change, you first need to understand what's called the greenhouse effect. The Earth gets its heat from the sun. In the atmosphere, greenhouse gases, like carbon dioxide, trap this heat and keep it from escaping into outer space. Trapping some heat is a good thing because it keeps the planet warm enough for us to live. But here's the problem. People all over the world are adding extra carbon dioxide to the atmosphere. How? By burning fossil fuels like coal, oil, and gas for everyday activities, from driving cars and heating our homes to using computers. All this extra carbon dioxide traps more heat in the atmosphere, making the Earth warmer and causing other changes. What can we expect? As we've already experienced, potentially more powerful storms, flooding, droughts, and heat waves. And those changes can cause additional problems, like the spread of certain diseases, wildfires, even food and water shortages. Looking at the big picture, we can put less carbon dioxide into the atmosphere by generating electricity from clean sources, like solar and wind power, instead of burning coal, oil, or gas. But there are smaller steps you can take today to help our climate. For example, drive less and use public transportation. Choose more eco-friendly cars. Reduce energy use by turning off lights, computers, and TVs. And walk or ride your bike to school or work. 
It's easy to think as individuals we can't have an impact when it comes to an issue as complex as climate change, but small changes can add up to big differences for all of us. I'm Carol Ann Riddell for Science and You. I'm Lisa Beth Kovitz. Global warming, climate change, call it what you like. Our world, our city, and our shorelines are different than they used to be. I spoke to Stephen Picard, a Queens College geologist who studies the history of climate change. He's also a hometown boy who grew up right here on the Rockaways. The entire Rockaways is suffering because of what's happening today. Professor Picard was part of a team studying changes in the Antarctic ice sheet. Turns out this isn't the first time our planet has experienced an epic global warming. Antarctica has been the ground zero for climate change. It has changed more than any other place on Earth. It went from a um, tropical landscape. We just found a pollen from palm trees 50 million years uh, ago in Antarctica. And just like today, ancient Antarctica experienced dramatic increases in atmospheric levels of CO2. Adding CO2 into the atmosphere warms the atmosphere, thereby warming the oceans, causing them to expand, causing sea level to rise. There were no cars, there were no us all those many millions of years ago. What was causing those CO2 rises? Well, it wasn't because the lemurs were driving around in SUVs. Today, we're throwing in lots of greenhouse gases, primarily carbon dioxide as well as methane. And the last time that the atmosphere changed more rapidly than what we're doing right now was 65 million years ago. And guess what happened then? A huge asteroid hit the Earth and wiped out the dinosaurs. But this time we're the asteroid. Yes, we are, unfortunately. A warmer Earth has caused sea levels to rise around the world. And according to Professor Picard, that rise is not the result of melting glaciers. Most of it is due to the ocean warming, and when water warms, it expands. We haven't even felt the impact of these glaciers melting yet? Well, no pun intended, but we, this is just the tip of the iceberg. <laughs> the ice takes a lot longer to warm up, and so there's a thermal inertia. But once that warms up enough, and we're already starting to see this in the Arctic Ocean, in the Greenland ice sheet, that the glaciers are starting to accelerate and they're melting. But what do rising sea levels mean for our cities right now. We've been invited by the Stevens Institute of Technology to join them on a survey of the changes to the shoreline. We have tide gauges that show that um, sea level has risen in this area about a foot in the past century. So uh, that plays a role when we have storms like Sandy. Basically uh, the storm itself is riding on top of water which is a foot higher than it was in the past. So thinking in terms of flooding that that may cause or where the waves are attacking that's important. And we've been uh, at this beach in particular surveying since 2008 and the changes that we saw after Sandy uh, are significantly more than we've seen after any other storm. A lot of the low-lying areas on the New Jersey coast now they actually flood on a, on a high spring tide because Basically, you have water coming up in the bays and actually rushing back up the storm sewers. The storm sewers are supposed to drain into the bay, but if the water level in the bay is higher than the water level in the street, the bay water is going to end up in the street. It just kind of pushes the water up the pipe. So that's certainly a product of climate change. When uh, Superstorm Sandy hit the New York City area, the storm surge from that was about eight feet. We were at high tide, and then we had another eight feet on top of that. And you saw the results. We're expecting sea level to rise at least three feet in this century. The world is warming up and it's going to continue accelerating. But that's, a, that's really a problem that we can tackle. We can make decisions to help us prepare for that. Right now we have the technology to become sustainable. More solar panels, more wind turbines, more fuel efficient cars. It's great technology. It's great jobs for us if we do it. This has been Lisa Beth Kovitz for Science and You. I'm Donna Hanover. New York Harbor was once home to 50% of the world's oysters. On any given day in the 1800s, you could find six million oysters on barges tied up along the city's waterfront. In fact, Ellis Island and Liberty Island were known as Little Oyster Island and Great Oyster Island. Oysters are ecological superheroes. They absorb particles in the water, they create habitat for up to 300 species, and they protect our shorelines by diminishing some of the wave energy that comes in. Emily Driscoll is the environmental science documentarian behind the award-winning film, Shell Shocked, Saving Oysters to Save Ourselves, which traces the near extinction of New York oysters and shows why we need them back. One oyster can filter up to 50 gallons of water per day. So if you get a whole reef in there, you can just imagine how much it would filter all the water in the system. 
In the face of climate change, while a resurgent oyster population could clean our water, it could also reduce the impact from a major storm surge. The oysters provide a very crenellated, detailed mosaic of a surface that um, helps to stop the wave action and dissipate the wave action. Kate Orff is a landscape architect working to reintroduce the oyster to New York Harbor through a process which has been dubbed oyster texture. Oyster texture came about because um, you can't just simply reintroduce the oyster into a bay that has been dredged and shallowed and flattened and, um, and um, it's, we've, we've, we've added these sort of hard edges to our entire coastline, bulkhead at the edges, so there's not really any room for habitat to um, take hold again. So we're working with a team, we're using this hydrodynamic model, which is a model of how water moves through the entire harbor, to study where wave attenuating reefs and protective coastal structures could optimally be placed to protect the communities that were hardest hit by Sandy. If you have a big, robust sort of reef system, then it's incredibly effective for attenuating waves. So what happened to the oysters in the first place? Over time, sewage in the water contaminated the oysters as food and killed off many of them. In addition, dredging for commercial shipping lanes destroyed their habitat. So while you can eat farmed oysters today, wild oyster populations are currently less than 1% of what they once were. I wanted to make a film about wild oysters in New York Harbor for a number of reasons. Uh, just to show how ubiquitous oysters were and how significant oysters were to New York culture, economy, society, ecology, um, and how quickly that was forgotten. That was just the last oyster beds closed in the 1920s and uh, pretty much we just moved on from there. New York was once the perfect location for oysters because the harbor is an estuary with the dynamic confluence between freshwater rivers and saltwater oceans. Oysters can't go out and get their food. They have to wait their, for their food and particles to come to them. So in estuaries, there's a lot of tidal flow. There's a lot of particle moving, so they can just sit back and you know, try to get all these particles coming into themselves since they can't move. And when those particles are pollutants, the oysters gobble them up too, cleaning our waters in the process. They really do so much for our water and for our, our whole estuary well-being but they just kind of sit there. They're a very unassuming species. You would never know like how much they do. And that's why scientists are trying to bring them back. In order to restore oysters in a significant way to the estuary, you need a critical mass of animals. Oysters like to settle on top of other oysters and create this three-dimensional structure and habitat. So if there aren't enough shells in the water, the oyster larvae are just kind of going to go floating around and they're not going to find a place for to settle and build other oysters. We're building oyster texture with very readily available materials, rock, <laughs> shells, you know, there's ways to kind of um, build rock piles and seed them with um, spat, which are oyster kind of larvae, and um, to begin to sort of jumpstart the, the oyster um, breeding process. That it's very important that for, you know, in this brave new world of climate change and sea level rise, um, that we have to have a different relationship with the natural environment and with what we kind of put in a box that's called science. In addition to Kate Orff's team, more than 27 organizations are now working together to restore this vital cog in New York's history and ecology. Similar projects are underway in cities around the world. Why is it so important to you and to so many people to try to bring back the oyster population? In the oyster restoration, it's not just about the oysters, it's about looking to what nature originally gave us to protect us and to clean our water, to create habitat for species. It's so much bigger than the oyster. Awareness is a lot greater now than it was 10 years ago, and I think that's the first huge step in making change. While restoration efforts are still in their infancy, the future looks brighter for the New York oyster. If we can protect the oyster's habitat, we'll do a great deal to protect our own. I'm Donna Hanover for Science and You. I'm Mike Gilliam for Science and You. As solar energy comes more and more to the forefront of our lives, innovators are pushing the envelope to bring us better products. Now, one of those is Sam Cochran. He is one of the inventors of something called Solar Ivy. Sam, what is Solar Ivy? Solar Ivy is a modular system for deploying solar panels across the surface of our buildings and takes the form of ivy, the plant. Okay, so this is not your dad's solar panel. 
No, it's not. Uh, traditional solar panels are, are rectilinear and require a bit more to install them on the building and especially a bit more to install them on a facade. We have a very versatile system that allows for us to have a high level of customization so that each solar panel, while looking like Ivy, is optimized for that location, uh, whether it's the building's location or that location of the leaf across the surface of a building. Show me. Um, so, here we have one of the first working prototypes of Solar Ivy, and each one of these leaves is tuned for a specific angle and rotation given a building's location on the globe and that building's orientation. So, so let's say you're on the northern hemisphere and you have a, uh, a south-facing wall. Um, that would be an ideal location for solar. But not every building has that south-facing wall. So if you're southeast or southwest, we can tune Solar Ivy to maximize all of your solar gain for that that surface. Does it work better than the large panels? It works uh, in the same way that any large panel would, um, only we have fragmented cells. So while a large rectilinear panel has a, a higher density of cells, um, we're taking those cells and spreading them out slightly, um, allowing us for do that, to do that angle and rotation without shading other leaves. Cochran says the design is efficient. And depending on the technology, they can have many types of thin solar panels incorporated in the solar ivy, but be far more flexible than traditional solar panels. Now let's talk about the actual leaves themselves a little mm -hmm. bit. Now this is, this is actually one of the first versions of our new type of leaf. Um, it allows for us to orient the leaves in their angle and also rotate the leaves. And we're able to do that through a proprietary software so that we can look at a building, build uh, all of the surrounding elements that might be shading that building or affecting how much sun hits that building and have those elements of each leaf respond to that, that information. In this rendering, you see a brownstone covered with solar ivy. And Cochran says the cells on that facade could power the kitchen free for the whole year. But that does not include the initial investment of about $30,000 to go solar. Cochran says converting from early solar technology to solar ivy would be much cheaper. This actually happens to be a vacation home, so we would actually be pushing the power back into the grid since they weren't going to be using as much of it. Selling electricity back to the electric company? Yes. I like that. And they have to give you a check. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. The folks at Solar Ivy say eventually many of these applications could be adapted to be more mobile and used on things other than fixed buildings. So we've shown some of the new solar technology, and one thing is certain, people are actively working to make solar a much larger part of our lives. I'm Mike Gilliam for Science and You. I'm Magalie Laguerre-Wilkinson. Forecasting the weather is a highly technical enterprise, and scientists strive to be as accurate as possible. How do they do it? We went to the National Weather Service to find out. It rains. It snows. The winds blow and the oceans crash on coastlines. It's Mother Nature at work. Relentless, alive, never at rest. Forecasting weather, what will happen in advance, when, where, and for how long is a full-time assignment. This is where scientists search for clues as to Mother Nature's intent. This is the center of it all, the National Weather Service Forecast Operations Center on the grounds of the Brookhaven National Laboratory on Long Island. This forecasting office is under the umbrella of the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, or NOAA. Meteorologists here are on watch around the clock, observing and tracking weather systems and atmospheric conditions with cutting-edge science. All of it to learn if the sun will shine tomorrow. Data streaming in here 24-7 is from around the globe and from diversified sources, including satellites and good old-fashioned weather balloons. The GOES, or NOAA's geostationary satellites, watch weather in the Western Hemisphere by hovering around 22,000 miles above the equator, orbiting the planet at the same speed it's turning. Gary Conti is a warning coordination meteorologist with the NWS. And here we can actually then validate what GOES is actually showing us, the fact that we have clusters of heavy showers and thunderstorms that are moving east-northeast ahead of a low pressure system from northeastern Kansas, northeast right across Chicago. And we are getting lightning strikes to the tune of almost 2,000 strikes every 15 minutes. Pose, 
Polar orbiting environmental satellites circle the globe every 102 minutes, more than 500 miles above the surface. And in this particular picture, you can basically see, again, those two areas, one basically associated with the cluster of heavy showers and thunderstorms that are moving east-northeastward toward Chicago, and the other one typically here across the Ohio and Tennessee valleys. Poe's data track the subtle changes in the environment that can trigger serious conditions such as tropical storms and tornadoes. It's the job of these weather scientists to make sense of it all. When we talk about winter storms, we talk about blizzards, we talk about hurricanes, we have a good feel and the forecast model, they have improved greatly with their accuracy. So meteorologists, I think, are fairly comfortable when we look at the larger scale storms, which we call synoptic scale storms. We hear a lot about Doppler radar. How does that work? Right behind you, we have our Doppler weather radar that's been here at the office since October 1993. The dome itself actually houses a satellite dish that focuses that narrow beam of energy and it rotates in a clockwise direction and as it does so, it scans several slices of the atmosphere. And uh, those are all what we call volume coverage GANs. But if we have heavy showers and thunderstorms approaching our way, we basically increase the rotational rate and the number of slices within the atmosphere to get more detailed information regarding the development of upstream showers and thunderstorms. Using improved sciences, evolving technologies, and broader media platforms, NOAA's National Weather Service is transforming operations to better assist and alert citizens to extreme weather conditions such as Superstorm Sandy. They want us to be a weather-ready nation. The goal of the program basically matches with the mission of the National Weather Service, and that's to prepare our constituency, everyone from the general public to the emergency managers that we work with, to the aviators, the mariners, teachers and educational institutions, to learn about weather, weather hazards, when the National Weather Service issues warnings, how to prepare for, monitor, and act. NOAA and the National Weather Service hope that the Weather Ready Nation initiative will empower first responders and all of us to make smart, life-saving decisions in the face of extreme weather. I'm Magalie Laguerre-Wilkinson for Science and You. I'm Andrew Falzone. By the year 2050, scientists estimate that nearly 9 billion people will be living on our planet. Keeping all those mouths fed will have a huge impact on our environment. A new exhibit here at the American Museum of Natural History called Our Global Kitchen shows exactly how our environment and our food are interconnected. Displays and dioramas at the Global Kitchen exhibit depict agricultural scenes from across our planet. Nearly 40% of the Earth's surface not covered by ice is used for agriculture. That's 23 million square miles, an area three times the size of the United States and Canada combined. Bushels of corn per acre are 10 times what they were in my grandfather's day. But that has come at a real cost. We now produce more food than at any other point in human history. In 2010, we grew 2 billion tons of corn, wheat, and rice. But according to the experts curating the exhibit at the American Museum of Natural History, all that farming has a tremendous impact on our environment. And the cost is a reliance on non-renewable resources, fossil fuels that are used to make the pesticides, the herbicides, and the synthetic fertilizer. As those supplies are beginning to diminish, we have to look forward to a future where we will rely more on renewable resources and yet maintain the yield necessary to feed the world. Agriculture is responsible for over 30 percent of our greenhouse gas emissions. Along with farming of vegetables, agriculture also includes livestock production, which accounts for more than one-third of our greenhouse gas emissions. That means eating more vegetables and less meat is better for the environment. 35% of the foods that we produce go to feeding those livestock. So if we eat lower on the food chain, we have an opportunity to have a lower impact. 
Food waste is another major problem. The Environmental Protection Agency estimates that 97% of all wasted food ends up in landfills. The waste gives off a gas called methane, which contributes to global warming. One way to reduce the impact of food production on the environment is to eat what's already around us. Ancient humans used to forage for survival, but we met one woman who's turned it into a fine art. In fact, the fruits of her work end up on the plates of patrons of some of New York City's most exclusive restaurants. So I would say it's really gathering plants um, that have not been you know, grown in a garden or uh, that, are not a, are, that not a cultivated farm. Her book, Foraged Flavors, is nominated for a prestigious James Beard Award. It offers a guide for those who want to forage on their own. I realize that people are used to thinking there has to be a picture that exactly matches that. It's not always going to match because in the, in the wild, things are, have so much variability. It's not a cloned carrot, right? So there are pictures at the time when it is best to pick, but it also has kind of um, kind of a five easy step process. And getting started can be easier than you think. If you've picked, you know, a berry off a bush or, you know, nibbled on something, then you've foraged sometime in your life. So wherever you are and whatever you eat, just remember that your food choices have an impact on the environment. If you want to check out the Our Global Kitchen exhibit here at the American Museum of Natural History, it'll be here for you until August 11th. I'm Andrew Falzone for Science and You. That's our show for today. Thanks for joining us. I'm Mike Gilliam. See you next time on Science and You.